Okay, so this is a lecture on sensation and perception, which is one of my favorite topics. I actually teach a class called Sensation and Perception that you could take as a 200 level class. So I hope you like this stuff. I think it's pretty fascinating. So the whole idea is what information is out there in the world? How do you get that information into your heads? And what do you do with that information? How do you process it? And how do you act on it? So the first example that we'll talk about and spend the most time talking about is uh, uh, okay, sorry about that <laughs> is vision. So what is it that we see? Do we see things, objects, people, balls, trees? No actually. We see light. We see light, which is a subset of the electromagnetic spectrum that is radiated as waves and reflected by surfaces. So the electromagnetic spectrum is huge, um, all the way from gamma rays to radio, radio waves. Um, um, and there's this one tiny little chunk of it it is visible light, right? So we've all heard of ultraviolet and infrared, which are kind of like light, but we can't quite see them. Um, and so there's this little slice here, and it goes from, you know, blue to red, roughly. Roy G. Biv, you've all learned by now. And, and that little slice of, of the electromagnetic spectrum is what our eyes has have evolved to detect. Um, and the reason they have done so is because information that is contained in that light is informative about the objects which reflect it to our eyes. So it's a bit of a weird way to think about it, but we, we don't really see things. What we see is the light that is reflected by things. So how is light perceived? Well, there's a thing out there in the world, like this tree, uh, that reflects light in all directions. Some of it will head straight into your eyeball. Um, and so light will pass through the pupil, which is just the hole in your eyes, kind of like the, um, the focal point in a camera, and is, is focused by the cornea and lens to hit the back of your retina. Um, and this image is inverted along both axes. It's kind of inside out because the rays pass through, the rays of light pass through uh, the center of your fovea and then is kind of upside down and backwards on the back. And textbooks, including your own and pretty much everyone else that I've ever seen, and videos and popular psychology always make a big deal of this, of, of the image being upside down on your eye as if that's a problem, but it's not at all. And, and in fact, making a big deal out of this upside down property, I think, is a, a fundamental confusion about sensation and perception. So if you were kind of watching the movie displayed on the back of your eyeballs, then I can see how that being upside down would be a problem. But but no one is watching that movie, right? There's no little man inside your head that, that watches the movie of the eyes and listens to the sound of the ears and all of that. It's, it's just, eyeballs are just information processing devices, right? And when your digital camera or your phone takes a picture, it doesn't care that um, what used to be the top of the tree is now on the bottom, right? All it cares about is that there is some faithful mapping between the way things are in the world and the information that is received onto your retina. Your eyeballs and your brain would not care one bit if the image was completely mixed up so that the top left portion of the tree ended up in the middle of the bottom and the center ended up in the top right or you know, was all jumbled together into the back of your eyeball. Who cares? Because you would always know that 
images that hit the bottom middle come from the top left of the tree or whatever that is. So as long as it's a, a regular mapping such that you know, certain portions of the eyeball always receive the same certain bits of information from the world. Who cares if it's upside down or flipped around or rotated or sideways or any of that? It doesn't matter because no one is watching the movie on the back of your eye. This is just information being fed into your brain and processed. So that's my little speech about that. <laughs> so when, when the image hits the back of your eyeball, the retina, Photons of light, this light energy, is absorbed by these visual pigment cells and converted into electrical signals by receptor cells called rods and cones. And that's what sends the electrical energy to the rest of your brain so you can process the visual stimulus. So these signals are further analyzed. So, pirates. <laughs> so another property um, that your textbook talked about in terms of visual processing is this dark adaptation. How I mentioned rods and cones and these different receptor cells have different uh, capabilities in terms of processing visual stimulus. And you know how when you turn the lights out in your room at night or in your house, at first you can't see anything, but if you get up in the middle of the night, you can see just fine. And that's because of dark adaptation, right? Your eyes get used to there not being um, much light. Uh, your phobias dilate. Um, and you're able to receive much more light into your eyes and see better. So who cares? Well, pirates care. And this is why. So have you ever wondered why pirates wear eye patches? It is not because people happen to be losing eyes all the time when being pirates. You know, if you are in a sword battle with someone and you're fighting, chances are you're not going to lose an eye. You're going to lose a limb, right? So they can explain the peg legs, but the sword battles don't really explain why all of them have an eye patch on, right? What's the deal with that? Well, when boarding a ship, fighting would often move below decks, right? So you jump onto someone else's boat and you stab as many people as you can and then you run out of people to stab. So you've got to go down the stairs to find more people to stab. But there were no electric lights on a boat, right? This was before the days of electricity and although they had some, you know, candles and lamps, you obviously wouldn't want a lot of fire in the middle of your wooden ship. So lighting was very scarce, so it was really dark below decks. So if you jumped from the bright sunshine down into a dark room below, you weren't going to be very effective at stabbing. So how do you not run into walls, much less um, be an adequate swordsman? Well, here's what you do. You start with an eye patch on one eye, and when you're above deck, you're fighting with just your right eye open and your left eye is kept dark adapted behind the eye patch because no light is going into it. And then once you get down the stairs, you take the eye patch and you switch it from left to right. And now your dark adapted eye allows you to stab as many people as you want uh, without running into any walls. Isn't that a beautiful solution? I love that. I, it's just such a intelligent way to solve such a gruesome problem <laughs> that, and and the eye patch has, has followed us down through cultural history but we totally forgot why so that's that's some cool applications of perception science there so of course lack of binocular vision right only having one eye instead of two would hamper depth perception slightly and and cut out some of your peripheral vision but it would probably be worth the cost because if you try and go below deck straight from uh, the bright sunshine, you would be basically worthless. So there you go. Now you all know how to make use of, of this science in the real world. <laughs> okay, so one of the big problems with vision is uh, this many to one mapping problem. So this concerns depth perception, just like we were talking about before. So when when objects are in the real world, they're of course three-dimensional objects laid out in a three-dimensional world. 
but when they project onto your retina, the light that is reflected from them onto your eyeball is, is only a two-dimensional thing, right? Your, your retina is, is a two-dimensional image recording device, much like a camera. And so you have this problem where there is a loss of information here. Um, and so we have to try and figure out which, which possible thing in the real world led to the image that we're seeing, right? So in this example they show, all three of those funky objects would give rise to the exact same image on the back of the retina. And so we have to make some assumptions about what thing really did make that image, right? So it's more likely to be a rectangular object like that first one and that second one. And maybe we'll, instead of that third one, which has that weird skew to it, and, and maybe we'll also assume that it's more likely to be upright than leaning backwards, or, you know, we can use all kinds of different inferences and what are called heuristics, which are basically just assumptions we make about what things are like in the real world that can usually get us to the right answer, although they will definitely make mistakes. So one of the theories uh, about how we draw these conclusions about things in the world is called unconscious inference. So Helmholtz, who is a super old dude who was doing psychology before there really was such a thing as psychology, propose that we automatically make assumptions about the things that we perceive. One of these assumptions is called the lighting from above hypothesis, this uh, heuristic or something like that, where, where we usually make the assumption that the light in a situation is, is coming from above. And that's a good assumption, right? So the sun is above us and we tend to always have overhead lighting, right? It's uncommon that the light is coming down from down below you which is one of the reasons why it looks so weird if you're gathered around a campfire and you have a flashlight under your face or something like that. So to see how that relates to this um, unconscious inference kind of thing. So I'm going to show you this picture here on the left and you can see that uh, the top and bottom rows are bulges, right? They're coming out towards you whereas the middle row is dense, right? It's, it's going in toward the computer screen. Well, watch what happens when I rotate this object upside down, right? All right, pay attention, stare at it. See what happens. Okay, it's just spinning around, and then boom. All of a sudden, what do you see now? The top and bottom rows are now dense. They're now going in, and the middle row is coming out. Isn't that crazy? I, I just love how how fast that switches on you, like before you can even see it happening. So here, we'll do it again. Look, you got dense on top, or dense in the middle. Spins around, okay, same thing. Wait, what's going on? Whoa, the dents are on top and bottom. Sorry, <laughs> I like it. But you can see how if the light is coming from above, then when we see light hitting the top of a circle, like in that middle row now, it must be because it is bulging out, right? Because if it was dented in, the light would hit the bottom, like on the top and bottom rows. So back here, when the light is on the top, it looks like it's bulging out. So similarly, this footprint looks kind of weird. It looks like it is, it's not, um, pressed into the sand, but rather it's coming up from out of the sand, right? Like someone sculpted it somehow. Um, and the reason why, oh, I don't have it flip upside down, but the reason why is this lighting from above, right? If the light were coming from the top, it would be hitting all of those edges of the footprint only if it were to rise out of the sand, right? So the light must really be coming down from the bottom here in order for this picture to look the way it does. And, and we usually assume that that's not the case. So another example of this kind of process is, is here, where these researchers did this really cool thing where they took the exact same blob that you see there in figure A, and they put it into a bunch of different pictures. 
And depending on the context of the picture, you think that it's a completely different thing. So I promise you this exact same blob is the thing that looks like a beer bottle in the top right, looks like a dude's shoe in the bottom left, and then in the bottom right, it looks like both a pedestrian and a car, depending on its orientation. So this is evidence of what's called top-down processing. Bottom-up processing is, is the idea of what you perceive, what you think you see, is, is a function of the information that is coming into your eyeballs and being fed in through your sensory systems. Top-down processing is the idea that what you see, you know, it is a function of the bottom-up stuff, but it's also a function of your expectations, of, of what you expect to see, what you think you're seeing, and a lot of more cognitive factors. So you can see that uh, when this exact same bottom-up image, this blob, is at the bottom of this guy's foot, you assume it's going to be a shoe, right? And you assume the beer bottle and all of these different things. So the exact same sensory information can be interpreted a bunch of different ways, depending on the context. All right, so another way, so one of the primary themes in sensation and perception is how the things that we perceive, the things that we see, are not just a function of this sensory information that is coming in through our eyes and ears and such, but also these top-down processes. An another good example of this is um, how what's called size constancy. How when someone is walking away from you, they get smaller in terms of the image that is projected onto your eyeball, but you don't perceive them as getting smaller, right? You perceive them as just walking away from you. Um, and so you can see in, in the top part of this figure how the closer this woman is to your eyeball, the greater the visual angle she will take up, the more space on your retina that her image will, will take up. And so people have done experiments to test, um, so the way that we're actually measuring sizes in terms of optics is, is in degrees, right? How much of your retina is taken up? And the exact same amount of retinal space will be taken up by a small thing that is super close to you or a big thing that is really far away, right? Like when you use your thumb to cover up someone's head, your thumb and that person's head are both taking up the same amount of retinal space, so in terms of visual degrees, uh, but, but you see one of them as being much bigger than the other, right? This person's head is clearly bigger than your thumb. But the only reason you know that is because you have some kind of inherent knowledge about distance, right? And, and this is knowledge that is added on top of the information that you have about just what, what you see in terms of visual angles, All right? So um, on the bottom is just a figure from an experiment where they, they did to try and test how, how good people are at... Um, telling how far away something is if there's not as much context there. So that's all we're going to talk about for vision, right? There's a ton of other stuff, but I'm trying to just keep it brief. So let's talk a little bit about sound now. So sound is actually the physical stimulus is very similar to the physical stimulus in vision. And this is something we don't think about a lot of times, but the physical stimulus in terms of sound is this pressure change in the air, right? So when, when you've got a speaker playing, what it's doing is it's pushing in and out, and it's compressing and expanding the air. And your eardrums are able to sense these pressure changes and translate them into sound. So it's kind of like the ripples in a pond. Uh, so you're really hearing waves, right? Sound waves. We've heard that term before. And what we mean by wave is just that the the air pressure is changing. It goes up and then down and then up and down in a very regular pattern. Um, kind of like something that looks like this, right? So these are very simplified versions of stimuli and in the real world sounds are much more complex. 
but it, it's something like this where the air pressure goes up and down and up and down like a sine wave um, which is very much like a light wave right <laughs> light is also the same kind of process um, so in terms of sound there are two main dimensions for these things so these three waveforms here vary in terms of how big they are right the vertical distance between the highest point and the lowest point and that's called the amplitude and perceptually we will think of that in terms of loudness right so if a sound has larger amplitude if the speaker is pushing further forward and further back when it's making the sound pressure wave then you'll hear a louder sound than if it's a small one the other dimension is frequency right so how quickly that speaker is moving in and out how quickly that sound wave is is going up and down um, and that we hear in terms of pitch so high pitched sounds have a high frequency and low pitched sounds have a low frequency um, and and you can see here that these two are independent dimensions right so on the left we have three different amplitudes that all have the same frequency there are three peaks in each of those and on the right we have the same amplitude with three different frequencies. There's only two peaks in the bottom one, and there's five in the middle, and I don't know, maybe eight or ten in the top one. So that's what the physical stimulus is like. All right, so now that was the physical form of the stimulus, but now we're talking about the perception of the stimulus. So even though I said that the amplitude of the waveform corresponds to how loud the this, this sound will seem to you and the frequency corresponds to the pitch there is not a nice even one-to-one -one mapping between these two things and so what we have is these things called audibility curves which are just basically is something audible or not can you hear it um, and, and something called an equal loudness curve. So what we can see, this graph here on the right, is a mapping between frequency and decibels, which is uh, a measure of amplitude. And you can see those two red lines are showing equal loudness curves. So every stimulus along one of those curves is perceived at exactly the same volume. But you can see that, um, for instance, point D uh, is at a, has a higher amplitude of 60 decibels rather than point C, which only has 40 decibels. But they're perceived at exactly the same volume to the listener because they're at different pitches, 100 hertz versus 1,000 hertz. And it turns out that there's not this nice, clean separation between volume and pitch like there is between amplitude and frequency. So as is always the case, the perceptual story is a lot more messy and complicated rather than the raw physical dimensions. So your perception of how loud a 60 decibel sound is will depend on what frequency it's in, even though the, the amplitude doesn't depend on the frequency. When we perceive things, it's this kind of complex uh, combination of, of the underlying dimensions, and that, that makes things a lot messier. And like I said, it tends to be the case for all of sensation and perception. Um, your perception of brightness is dependent on a whole bunch of different things, things like that. Other things that make um, sound more complicated is, is we have to move beyond just frequency and pitch. So there are, so if you even have a passing knowledge of music, you know that, you know, there's, there's only this sequence of something like 12 notes. <laughs> I'm not perfect at music, but a, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then it repeats again, plus some sharps and minors in there. And why is it that um, 
why does it repeat? Why do we call one sound an A and another higher one also an A? You know, what is this phenomenon of octaves? How are those two sounds the same? And it, it turns out that it's multiples of the same frequency. So you can see on this piano down here that um, the very lowest A on a keyboard has a frequency of 27.5 hertz. Well, one octave up is exactly twice that frequency, 55 hertz. And then twice that frequency again is 110 hertz, and twice that is 220 hertz. And so this doubling of frequencies raises things one octave. So there is some way in which a, an A in, you know, this third A kind of is the same note as the first A, it's just higher pitch. That, and this is what's called tone chroma, or the color of, of the tone. Um, and like I said, it complicates things vastly, you know, and, and that's why different chords have different properties where, you know, one chord sounds happy and all of the notes fit together really well and another can be more discordant. It can, it can sound really bad if you've got, you know, two notes that are right next to each other um, because they, their frequencies of those waveforms won't line up very well. If you've got um, that lowest A and the higher A, uh, the higher A is going twice as fast as the previous A, but they're going to overlap a lot. Uh, they'll, they'll line up because it's a multiple of the same frequency, and that's not true for ones that are different. <laughs> In general, it's just messy, is what I'm trying to say. Another thing we need to talk about is called timbre, even though it's spelled like timber. Don't ask me. I don't know. Maybe it's French or something. But it's the reason why the exact same high C, for instance, sounds completely differently when played on a piano rather than sung by a voice or played on a violin or, you know, an oboe or a flute or a trumpet. You know, all of these different instruments can play the exact same note, you know, same frequency, same amplitude in terms of decibels, but it'll sound completely different. And, and this is, there's a lot of other properties of sound that, that make real life sounds much more complex than these simple waveforms we were looking at before, you know, that real life sounds, you know, aren't going to be clean like this, that there's lots of other you know, like the reason why a guitar has a, a big wooden box on the bottom with a hole is to create resonances where the sound can bounce off and vibrate the wood at different frequencies. And, and real life sounds are just far more complicated. And it, it makes analysis of these types of stimuli incredibly complicated. But in general, you know, we can see that uh, sound is our perception of sound is, is really just a perception of, of vibration, of air vibrating. And we want to know how quickly it vibrates, the frequency, and, and how strongly it vibrates, the amplitude. And that can talk, tell us about pitch and loudness. And we can use that information for all kinds of important tasks that we need to know about. So let's move on from sound and let's jump into the somatosensory system which is um, a whole bunch of different stuff. So we've got these cutaneous senses. So your skin does a lot more than touch. It's kind of a miraculous sense organ in that it can tell you about, you know, textures and smoothness and hardness and density and all of those sorts of things. But it can also tell you about pain, you know, if you get a paper cut or something like that. It can, it's also your pain organ, you know, and it can also tell you a lot about temperature, right? So you use your skin to tell if something's hot or cold. Um, vibration is, is something that we can use to determine texture and, and other important things like that. And the skin does all kinds of, of cool sensory functions like this. Uh, another thing that you think your skin might be able to do is, is sense dampness, right? Have you ever touched something and you can quickly determine if it's wet or not, right? So do we actually have 
a moisture sensor in our skin? Well, actually, we don't. Actually, what you're what you're sensing is temperature again. Temperature is what you use to to figure out whether or not something's wet. Have you ever hung clothes out to dry and they've gotten really cold from a cold night, and then you feel them and you think they're wet just because they're so much colder? And that's why you get that kind of illusion. So. It does lots of cool things, but it, it actually, you do not have moisture sensors in your skin. <laughs> but there are other sensory systems that get lumped into this somatosensory, which is just kind of like body senses, you know, basically everything not in, on your face, <laughs> on the other senses. One is called proprioception, which is the sensation of where your body is in space. You know, and it's very highly developed in gymnasts or soccer players or athletes of any kind uh, where they don't have to look at their body to tell exactly how it's angled, how their ankle is positioned, all of those sorts of things. And it's also a system that, that can be uh, damaged during injury, right? So if you have sprained your ankle, it turns out that your, your knowledge of proprioception of where your foot is pointing at any given point is much diminished and that leaves you at an increased risk of re-injuring it again. So that's kind of something that you have to rebuild as this connection between how you move your muscles and where that puts your body in space, right? This is a, a very important sense to have, you know, it's what enables tall people to duck when they're gonna bonk their heads on a low doorway or something like this. You have to always have this knowledge of where you are in space. And there's something else that's very related, which is kinesthesis, which is kind of the knowledge of the movement of your body as it's going. So you've got these receptors in your joints that can tell how quickly your elbow is opening, that you can tell that it are used for a lot of the same tasks that we're talking about proprioception, but it's more based on movement. But for now, let's focus on the skin. So the skin, uh, is the heaviest organ in the body, more than 20 pounds, whereas your brain is a measly three. That's kind of shocking, but weird to think about. Just a pile of skin. Blah. Sorry, didn't mean to put that image in your head. So, skin is also useful in that it keeps your blood and guts from spilling out. So, seriously, this is a very useful function, right? To wrap up your insides and keep them inside of you. And it also keeps icky stuff from coming in, right? So it, it is this uh, germ barrier so that all of the dirt and pathogens and crud that's out there in the world doesn't just go walking right into your stomach and internal organs and such. This, this is a, a function that we kind of take for granted, but both of these things are a very important function that the skin performs in addition to all of the sensory things that it does for us. Um, but the sensory stuff is really what we're thinking about in here. All, all of the cool information that you can gain about the world through your skin. And your skin is always falling off of you and getting all over everything. Gross. Sorry. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, one thing that I think is most interesting to talk about when we're talking about skin is this thing called the homuncular map. So it's, it's this um, mapping between different parts of your body, skin surfaces, and, and where a touch stimulus on your skin would be represented in your cortex, on your brain. So if, if you've got someone's head that you can just open up and poke around on, what you can do is you can try poking different parts of the brain and see where someone thinks you're touching them. So if you poke this spot, they say, oh, that's my thumb, this spot might be their nose or something like that. And one thing that you'll notice from this map is that it's greatly distorted, right? So you see the lips are huge, but the lower back is tiny, right? Each lip has a bigger region of cortical space associated with it than your entire back. And, and that's meaningful in that you are much more sensitive to touch on your lips than you are on your back. So this is this brain region uh, where it's receiving signals from these different areas of the skin. And we see that there's more space devoted to sensitive areas like fingertips and lips. 
And one way you can test this is this thing called the two-point threshold, where you could try this yourself. You take two pencils or two pens or something like that, and, and you poke a different part of your body, your finger, your arm, something like that. And with your fingertip, you could put those two pencil tips really close together and, and touch your finger and still be able to detect that there are, in fact, two different points touching you. Whereas if you try this on your lower back, those two pencil tips are going to have to be more than an inch, probably two inches, maybe even three inches apart before you'll be able to de detect that there's actually two different ones instead of just one. So that's because much more of your brain processing centers are devoted to fingertips and lips rather than lower back. And so we're kind of prioritizing that kind of tactile input because it's more important to us, right? If you want to figure out how something feels, you're not going to rub your lower back against it. It's much more convenient to use your fingers, and so you'll have a lot better information there because uh, we're prioritizing that kind of input. And you can see that in, in the brain structures, in, the, in this homuncular map. You can see that much more space is devoted to these important places. And it's plastic, meaning that it can change through experience. So a violinist will have much larger areas for their fingers on, on the left hand versus right, because in the left hand it's really important where they put them, but the right hand just ho holds the bow, right? And, and they don't have to feel where the fingers are on the right hand at all. Whereas the left hand, exactly where those fingers are is a very important thing for them to know. Um, I'm sure that people who read Braille have much more highly developed and much greater brain space devoted to the fingertips that they usually use for reading Braille. And I imagine that they, that their other hand, that they don't typically use for reading Braille, will have a much smaller amount of cortical space devoted to it, right? Because when you train your brain to make these fine distinctions between different stimuli, it changes and it'll devote more space to the things that are most important to it and less space to everything else. So that's a general mapping of touch and I want to talk a little bit about pain. So in the textbook it talked about the gate control model. It's this model that the pain you feel is not determined just by the pain receptors but also by various cognitive mechanisms that can kind of allow you to feel the full brunt of that pain or limit it such that you might not feel any pain at all. Some of these mechanisms are expectation, right? So if, I give, if I'm wearing a, a fancy white lab coat and give you a important looking white cream and tell you that it's going to decrease the pain that you feel in your ankle and you rub it on there, there's a strong chance that you might feel less pain, even if the cream is inert, if it doesn't do anything at all. Just this expectation of having it help you can actually allow it to help you and you will feel less pain. Similarly, the more you pay attention to it, the more it will hurt, right? So if you can do something if you can pay attention to other things, kind of distract yourself, then you will actually experience less pain. And one cool uh, avenue that researchers are pursuing with regard to this is they've actually done experiments where they get kids to like play virtual reality video games while they're getting a shot. And the kid basically has no idea they're even getting a shot because they're so busy shooting the zombies or whatever. that they are really feeling less pain. You know, sometimes we think that when you're distracted, it's not that there's any less pain, it's just that you're paying less attention to it. But in a very real sense, when you are not paying attention to it, there is less pain for you. The pain actually goes away. And, and it's, pain is this weird ephemeral concept in that sense, that, that we kind of have a lot of control over it and yet we don't know how to control it, usually. Emotional distraction can also work, such as looking at attractive pictures or things like that. And there are all actually a lot of research into various hypnotic procedures for 
reducing uh, your experience of pain or actually even inducing it when there is no physical stimulus. So that's pain. Now we'll do a, a brief touching on, on taste and then smell. So taste, what is it? So it is important for not dying, right? So why do we have taste? Taste was not evolved so that we could prefer bacon and chocolate, right? That would be a very non-adaptive reason to evolve taste because that leads to obesity, right? <laughs> um, but taste evolved so that we could learn which sorts of foods um, were most useful to us in an energy sense, right? So fats and sugars provide the necessary sorts of energy that we need to, you know, run around and go hunt mastodons or whatever. So we have evolutionarily learned to prefer them. Now, of late, those um, preferences don't, don't do us any favors. Um, but we have to keep in mind that, that we evolved them long ago. Um, and so you might have had this experience where you crave certain foods containing nutrients you're lacking, such as salt, you know, and we've all heard the examples of how pregnant women sometimes have these really strange cravings, and there's some evidence that it's because they're lacking some particular nutrient that happens to be available in their favorite type of ice cream. <laughs> Um, I'll skip that for now, but taste is de decomposable into salty, sweet, bitter, and sour. Uh, there's this fifth taste called umami that is still pretty poorly understood and hard to describe, so we're not going to talk about it too much. But each of these tastes is associated with a very particular chemical. So sodium chloride is what we sense when we detect saltiness. Sucrose is, is the molecule that most perfectly excites our sweetness detectors. Quinine is for bitter and hydrochloric acid for sour. Glutamate is the umami one. And so what we're doing when we taste food is we're actually doing this sort of chemical analysis of, of what sorts of chemical compounds are available in the food. And that's important because it can help us pick the ones that we need. Um, Different flavors can be described in, in terms of combinations of these four, right? Some salty and some sweet and some different things like that. Uh, and, and different chemicals uh, will still excite, right? So sucrose isn't the only thing that tastes sweet. We also know about fructose and maltose and dextrose and all of the million other oses. And, and they all excite the same thing, and, but they might also excite a little bit of salty flavor and things like that. So what about smell? Smell is also is closely related to taste, is why we're talking about them back to back like this. Um, but smell is pretty tricky because there's this really poor mapping between molecular structure and scent. So there's it's still this molecular detection like like we were talking about with taste, but something as simple as coffee has a hundred different molecules associated with that smell. And something else to keep in mind is that when you are smelling that coffee, it's nev you're never smelling just coffee, right? Smells are never presented in isolation. Coffee might be accompanied by bacon and the dishes you forgot to do last night and the pollen that's being released from the trees outside and the laundry that you haven't washed yet, right? And there are all of these smells that are constantly around us. And so if you've never smelled coffee before and you smell these hundred new chemical compounds, how are you to know that all of them are produced by this one miracle beverage that helps you wake up? Well, it's, it's really complicated. We've got 350 different chemical receptors. And keep in mind, there were only four receptors for all of vision, right? So smell is this incredibly complex and still fairly poorly understood sense. Um, but it generally has a similar story as taste. So we've got these chemical receptors, far more of them for smell than for taste. And they fire according to which chemical 
is present in the thing that you are smelling. And um, these signals get aggregated and sent to higher brain areas. So what is flavor? Flavor is this combination of taste and smell. And it gets localized to the mouth via oral capture. And what I mean by that is the tactile sensations in your mouth of the food touching your tongue cause you to associate flavor as being produced inside your mouth even though a lot of the flavor that you're tasting is actually coming from your nose. So tiny little bits of the food that's in front of you is floating through the air and being inhaled into your nose. You, you know, and you're having direct contact with little molecules of food in your nose. But we don't feel like we're tasting something in our nose because those tactile sensations of the food in our mouth cause us to kind of localize uh, the perception of flavor to the mouth. And flavor depends on far more than just smell and taste, right? So texture and temperature are, are very important. I'm a huge fan of avocado in all things. It's a miracle food, but some people just can't stand it because of the kind of weird mushy texture that it has. Um, sound like the crunchiness of a food and the appearance of a food can also have huge impacts on how much you enjoy it. And even beyond sensations, we can talk about cognitive factors like expectations, right? So if I tell you this is a hundred dollar bottle of wine, science t says that you'll like it a lot more than if I tell you it's a five dollar bottle. Um, and it also changes with levels of hunger, learning, experience, all of these sorts of things. So the, the take-home points for this chapter are that we want to know about what's going on in the world. And we have these various information sources we can tap into. So light is this narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum. Sound are these waves of changing air pressure. Touch is compression or vibration of skin receptors. Taste and smell are the detection of chemical compounds. And these information sources can inform us in different ways, right? So we need to think about what are, why do we care? You know, what, what do we want information about? Well, one useful thing is, you know, predator detection. Is something trying to eat me right now? You know, seems like one of the most important evolutionary tasks that would be solved by sensation. And you can use light or sound uh, or maybe even touch to do that, right? If you feel the ground vibrating, maybe an elephant is running at you, right? If you hear a stick crack behind you, then you should turn around. If you see something moving, you know, we can use lots of these different information sources to do the exact same task. There's some cool research showing how some blind people have learned how to echolocate by making clicking sounds and listening to how they bounce off of objects around them. And they can actually use sound to complete tasks that we typically think of as visual, like figuring out the layout of a room and distances between objects and things like this. So there's not always this clear mapping between the task you want to do and the sense you'll use to do it. Oftentimes we find that different animals will solve the exact same tasks in different ways. So the other and last important thing we want to talk about is how what we perceive goes far beyond the information that impinges on our sense receptors, right? So our perceptions are dependent not just on pressure changes in sound and light waves, but our assumptions, our expectations, our learning, and our experience. And that's what makes perceptual science so complicated and interesting. And I, I hope you have your interest peaked.